have they said to you anything about helping us with upcoming earth changes or oh well, yes without a doubt they uh, once we have this reveal as i said in that short piece there they're prepared to share their technologies with us to help us develop a sustaining planet self-sustaining exactly. and exactly. Uh, uh, to obviously help us as well you know as they say if the we are polluting our planet at the moment it is dying we know that we all know that yeah uh, we're not doing anything about it uh, some yeah. small things they're not large enough uh, so yes the that's why they're very concerned and that's why we need to have this reveal now yes. for our future generations for the children of today really um so they will have a a good world to live in uh, and a healthy world uh, with a healthy healthy life and hopefully long lives like uh, like like we have you know but uh, yeah. with, without that change i mean i'm particularly concerned about the fukushima in relation to uh, the pollution that that's continuing to do. We don't hear a great deal about it, uh, but it's tremendously sad. And the ETs have technologies to neutralize the radiation Absolutely. and clean it up. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. So I've got the beautiful and gorgeous Kevin Briggs back on the show with me today. Welcome again, Kevin. Great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate you inviting me back on your show. It's a great honour again to be speaking with you. So, uh, and hopefully we can catch up on uh, some of the things I've been doing. Oh, I know. It's so great. I love your accent. Don't you love his accent? <laughs> his English <laughs> accent. He does live in Florida, but he is, he is uh, obviously British. So for those of you who haven't seen my other show with him, it wasn't too long ago. It was only a couple of months ago. But, uh, I, 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 you know, we explored your story for about two hours. There's so much to your story. But there's so much more. And there are so many questions I didn't ask you that I wanted to ask. And also you've got something that you would like to reveal to the public as well. I, I'm sure you're revealing it on many other shows. I think your guide said that they wanted to, you to do it, right? That's correct, yes. The, I know when I spoke to you last time, I'd be, been given the date uh, for the reveal, and that's the uh, Council of Eight or the group of eight that I interact with wanting to reveal themselves to our United Nations. I was asked to share that information with eight individuals, which I did by email, uh, and now just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, maybe 10 days ago, they've asked me to now openly share that uh, date, so I'm hoping to do that today with, with you. Okay, well, let me just read quickly your bio and then we'll go into that because I want to know why they've asked you that. So Kevin Briggs is an author and specializes in consciousness and the connection to ET and UFOs. He's recently published his book titled Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey, which I was just saying to Kevin, I haven't read yet. I should have really read it before we had a conversation, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and covers, which covers 56 years of your experiences of ET contact and UFO connections. Well, the experiences are really with your, your, your multidimensional self, let me say. It's not just all ET and UFOs. It's more about your spiritual contract, your multidimensional self, and uh, so on and so forth. This book is for people who are curious and perhaps they themselves have had an experience that they cannot explain and don't know where to turn. You're not alone, you say. Kevin speaks to many groups and UFO, uh, of UFO and ET enthusiasts. He uh, is eager to hear their interactions and has written articles and, that have been published in Truth Magazine. He published his um, book, was also mentioned in the Psychic News in the UK. So basically you were in contact with your guides, your spiritual guides who are actually non-terrestrial physical beings but living in another dimension and uh, all your life. And we went over this in the last show I did with you. So if you want to review the show, like you met them at seven and then at nine, yes, they sort was, of, hey? Yes, I was actually eight years old when I first eight. met them. I was, as I said before, I was in the uh, uh, bathtub at home and uh, 
I felt a change in the vibrational frequency in the room and two beings appeared to my right hand side. Um, they were slightly elevated off the floor. They were uh, very attractive, both of them. Both had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a, a tight fit in blue jumpsuit type uh, clothing. They were speaking telepathically to one another and I understood the conversation and I can describe briefly what happened. The uh, female said to the male, and I now know their name as I interacted with them all my life. Their names are Ort, O-R-T, and D, D-E-E. D said to Ort, who's the male, uh, is this a boy? And he said, yes, this is a boy. And then she questioned him and said, are you sure this is a boy? He says, yes, I, this is a boy. She said, but look at him, he's small, he's uneducated, he's frightened by our presence. And I was, I was terrified. And uh, there was some other conversation there, and then they left. And I was so frightened, I stayed in the bath, uh, the water went cold, I was shivering. My mother came to find why I was still in the bath, and uh, uh, I told her about the two beings, and she said it was my imagination. It wasn't, I've been in contact with them all my life, and they've introduced me to other higher conscious beings and they've educated me about consciousness uh, and that's the thread of their education throughout my life and i think i said before i wouldn't have spoken out about it i just enjoyed the interaction uh, enjoyed the extra uh, knowledge that they gave me and uh, it wasn't until uh, about three years ago i got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and uh, i came back into the bedroom i was just about to snuggle down in the bed and then uh, there's a bright light outside the window. The, uh, we, the light came in through the bedroom window, lit up the whole room like a myriad of butterflies. Uh, it was just pure white light. And then Orton D materialized at the bottom of the bed. So after the prison trees asked them what was the reason for uh, their uh, being there, and they said, Kevin, we want you to talk about your interactions with us. We want you to write about your interactions with us. In fact, we would like you to write a book. You will write two books. And uh, I remember saying, well, uh, I don't mind talking about my interactions with you, uh, but I'm not a writer. And they said, well, we will continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. And uh, uh, we will give you some information to include in the book, which they did. And, uh, and then I published the book uh, in May last year. And I'm surprised at the interest of so many people uh, interested in this topic. And uh, the second book I was writing, and then uh, I was asked by Ray Hernandez of the uh, Free Foundation, and uh, he asked me to write, uh, be a contributor to his new book, A Greater Reality. So I've condensed the second book and written it in a, a chapter, and, uh, we, and I've submitted it to Ray Hernandez for his consideration. So I'm quite honored that A, he asked me, and, uh, and, and it, uh, it completes my obligation in relation to the two books. So uh, hopefully they don't ask me to write anymore. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure uh, you could sort of squeeze out a few more books if you wanted to. <laughs> I may, I may, I may. Like I say, I'm not a natural writer, I have to work at it, and I'm sure many writers do, but uh, uh, I may well do. As things are continuing to progress, I'm getting more and more information, and, and it may just be a, a chronological order of the how things are unfolding, possibly. That may be, might be a future book, possibly. Now you've sold the scene now, Kevin. It's your fault. Well, you know, I don't know what you've got in the first book, but you've had a lifetime of experiences and we just touched, we just scratched the surface last time we spoke. We spoke about you seeing an orb when you were nine and then after that you had um, the ability to leave your body at will and you used to do that and sort of fly behind the bus and, you know, you could telepathically read people's minds and you could project your consciousness when you wanted to sort of look at which bus stop was more crowded when you were a kid. I mean, there were just so many things that you did with your consciousness as a kid and and uh, even though nobody around you seemed to be doing it or talking about it anyway you seem to sort of have this life with this expanded consciousness and it was comp completely normal to you which i love because i think that that's where we're all going as a human race we're all expanding our consciousness and we're at one time in history in the future we're all going to be able to do what you've lived but um so speaking to people like you is you know seeing how it works and 
uh, what I found fascinating was that you worked as a police officer for so many years in the UK. How many years did you work as a police officer? Oh, 19, 20 years. Oh. Um, so, uh, and I retired oh, probably about 18 years ago now. And then right. we moved over to Florida for the warmer weather. And, uh, and I sell real estate here in Florida. So oh, you still uh, before that, I was a, uh, a technician at the uh, University of Leeds. I was there for about 11 years, I think. And then uh, I left to join the police force. I was there for 19, 20 years. And then I came over here and I've been a, a real estate agent for 18 years now. So three varied careers, really. And now, so you, now an author. Now an so author. <laughs> now you're an author. So you're still working in real estate. <laughs> Yes, I still work in real estate. Yes, I, uh, I still I work from home. Uh, I'm self-employed, as it were. I have my license with a broker, and uh, but I work from home. It's uh, uh, very convenient. Uh, I get on the computer in the morning, go through my messages. Uh, if people want to see a house, I show them a house and things. So uh, it's not not like a proper job. <laughs> not like a proper job. Well, what <laughs> I find amazing is you've had such a sort of normal life that's not normal at all, sort of a normal, extraordinary life. And and I'm I'm really interested in how your uh, you know abilities you know dovetailed with your normal life. But maybe let's get back to the conversation. We'll talk about that in a minute. You know how being able to project your consciousness and leave your body and read people's minds and, and be empathic and all that stuff that we talked about. You call them. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where you get reading people's minds from. It was only Alton D that I was able to uh, read, read their, their, uh, their, well, their conscious thoughts, shall we say. As for individuals, I, I've never really uh, had that ability. Uh, perhaps if I explored it, I may have it, but uh, I haven't ex specifically explored that now. Well, okay, so I'm having a bit of a chat with my mob and um, they're saying once you have got telepathic ability, you know, reading people's minds is not about reading word for word what people are saying, but you feel, you feel empathically, you feel the vibration they, they evoke. So if somebody's saying to you, oh, I'm really well, I'm really happy and really behind the happy smile is like, gee, I hate you or I hate my life or I'm really depressed or I want to kill myself, you actually know that, you know, as... As the, so that's I would, like, I would go, yes. So that's I, what I, I call it. I, yeah. I would agree with that. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So yes. yeah, that's like reading people. So it's a, it's a telepathic oh, yeah. ability. A telepathic communi communication is, you know, we feel the uh, energy component of what people are thinking. It's it's not like the same communication as verbal communication. But let's no. get back to what you want to say because you want to tell people. Uh, so Orton D belong to a council. Uh, a, a galactic council and I was having a bit of a chat to my guides the other day because a lot of people have talked about uh, different galactic councils the council of 12 the council of eight the council of nine the council of seven the council of millions and I said um, everyone seems to have a different sort of number on the galactic council and they said to me this is what they said to me they said think about your governance structure on your earth and where you live, you live in a um, suburb which is governed by a body which is called a council. And there are different councils throughout your city that govern your city. And I said, oh, yeah, there is. And they said, same, same. So there are different councils that actually govern um, the overseeing of Earth as well as the galactic. There's not one galactic council I found out recently. So you're in communication with, with one of them and it's a council of eight and they're, they have a specific job. Do you want to talk about what they have said to you about? What I can do, yes. Know? I would agree with you with that, Karen. Yes, there are probably many councils and there are different groups speaking with different councils or different individuals. In my particular council, there are eight of them and I've had, as I say, contact with them from the age of eight and this continues today. Uh, the, uh, the group of uh, Orton D, who we've already spoken about, Anna, who's a blue avian type, bird type uh, ET. Zark, he's a small uh, grey. He's a mathematician and engineer, and he designs propulsion systems. And he has a, a small uh, three family offsprings. I don't know what you call them, actually, but uh, offsprings, children or whatever. And then Ra, he's a leader. He's very old. He's Anunnaki. He's also a watcher, he tells me. And then there's Targ, he's a tall gray and he's responsible for the security in this quadrant of the uh, galaxy uh, which is quite tremendous in itself you know he's also responsible responsible for the uh, uh, security of the council of eight themselves and then there's chica he's a, a mantis being uh, very intelligent very wise um i don't know a great deal about him i haven't had a great deal of interaction with him 
other than when I did meet him once, I asked if he was an entomologist and uh, he wasn't too happy about that. But, <laughs> but uh, and then the last one will be Orla. She's a tall white. And I believe, I think she's an astrobiologist. Um, so the different species uh, representing this quadrant of the, of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful. So what, so they've been communicating with you when I say they, the spokespersons, the people for the council have been Ort and D, who have been communicating with you. You're like, How do they communicate with you, Kevin? Do they communicate just putting thoughts in your head or do they physically show up every time they chat with you? Right. Well, th there's different modalities. Obviously, uh, the, uh, they do show up physically as well mm. as they did when I was uh, eight years old in the bathroom, as, mm. I, as they did when uh, three years ago in, in my bedroom. Uh, I've also seen them sort of just as a, an outline of, of a physical but not fully materialising. And right. then they'll many modalities of contact that they've used and they've used most of them including sort of dreams uh, okay. telepathic communication which we've spoken about mm. actually downloads as well where yep. they'll give you a, an amount of information like they did with the quantum unified field theory mm. uh, and they said to me that i was sat by my pool and they said they just gave me the information and they said your scientist understanding of the quantum unified field theory is correct uh, with uh, the four interactions, the uh, weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and the gravitational force. However, there's a fifth interaction, which is consciousness itself. And if you, um, your scientists include consciousness within their own quantum unified field theory, then well, they will have a better understanding of their own quantum unified field oh. theory. And when you that information by sat by the pool yeah that's a download another modality of contact and on that particular occasion i asked them for confirmation which i always do uh, that helps validate the information and uh, i asked them to show me a craft and a, a craft appeared immediately i went inside the house to get my wife sandy to come and witness the craft uh, and i'm thinking i hope it's still there hope it's still there because it's validation if someone else can see it and then Andy came out, and then a second craft appeared, then a third, then a fourth. A seven in total appeared, flew silently directly over our heads, moved off to 80 degree angle, and disappeared sequentially as, as they had appeared. So that was confirmation. So, uh, uh, so we've got we've got dreams, telepathic communication, downloads, actually showing us craft. Uh, I know on one occasion I was speaking to a small group of ETs who were uh, just flying past. Uh, just flying past. I mean, it's so so normal for me. And uh, <laughs> I was interacting with them, and um, I asked what they were doing in this location. And uh, the guy that was piloting the craft is called Tia. He's a small grey, and I know him. I've interacted with him in the past. So we had some interaction, and then uh, they left. And then I went to sit outside to have a coffee with Sandy. And she said, she'd, uh, I think we discussed this last time, with the, the rainbow appeared, then under the rainbow, a craft appeared. And then we looked at the time on the photograph that she took, and the, it was 8.30. The same time I was speaking with Tia, who was flying the craft, who just deviated from his flight path to come and see where I live. Yeah. Uh, it's, we, we as, did your, as your friends and families would do, they do the same things, but we don't, we don't fully grasp or understand that yet. I know. Well, we did chat about that last time and I do want to get into sort of different things of what we chatted about last time. So I might interrupt okay. you because people... That's oh, okay, can... fine. And then there's uh, obviously out-of-body experiences, another modality of contact, uh, channeling itself uh, with uh, another uh, modality of contact. And then there's the final one that I haven't actually had, which is a near-death experience. Uh, I don't particularly want one, so I'm happy with all the other modalities of contact. But my understanding of near-death experiences, very often people have it's a modality of contact with that higher consciousness, higher conscious self, higher conscious beings. Well, you have had a near-death experience. You just haven't had to die to have it. In fact, all of us have near-death experiences every night. We leave our physical body and, and oh, cruise okay. around. But uh, do we remember that? Because our, our consciousness, the way our consciousness is, doesn't allow us to remember that. You know, what, when we don't expand our, um, our field, our consciousness, then we don't have memory of these things. And um, we're not 
we're not aware anyway, just like we're not aware of our psychic ability or our empathic ability. We write it off. We get into the logical mind and we, anyway, so I'm going to come back <laughs> to the message they gave you. So they've given you a message through Orton D and um, I asked how they communicated with you. So Orton D since we've spoken have come to you and said, please share the date of the reveal that they talked about. Uh, how did they communicate with you when they asked you to do that? Okay, that was just a telepathic communication. Uh, perhaps if I mentioned the original, when they gave me the information, and then I can move on to the second part of the message. The mm -hmm. first part of the information I was given, actually in February this year, February the 1st, and uh, I was woken up by a large craft above the house with a tremendous noise. And normally they're very quiet, or you'll hear a, a slow hum. And but this woke me up, and I'd only been in bed about an hour and a half. I was in a deep sleep, and I looked at the clock, and it was obviously February the first. It was one 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 a.m. Uh, so I, they gave me the message that they wanted to uh, meet with our government's representatives at the United Nations. So I said, "What about the time and the date?" And they said they will give me that later. So I repeated the message to them, and then as confirmation, I said, "If this information is correct, can you turn that street light off?" that's outside my bathroom in the street, and the street light went out immediately. So that was confirmation. So I went back to bed, and then I was woken in the, in the morning, about quarter to eight, by someone jumping on the bed twice, physically. And uh, that woke me up, and they gave me the second part of the message, which was the uh, uh, location, the date and the time. And so I went into the bathroom, I repeated the location, date and time, and said, if this message is correct, and I've got it a correct understanding, bearing in mind it's now daylight, can you turn that street light on? And the street light came on immediately. So I've got confirmation of the synchronicity at the beginning of the message, and then confirmation by turning the street light off, and then turning the street light on. So, and as I said before, I always ask for confirmation uh, in relation to uh, telepathic communications. Now, uh, just only a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was contacted uh, again. I was I'd just woken up and they gave me a telepathic in information saying that they now wanted me to share that date and time uh, with uh, uh, anybody that would listen, really. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing. And the actual date is February the 1st. Uh, the time would be uh, 0639, they said they would show the craft and they would land at the United Nations at 0641. Uh, and then, um, but it was dependent on a, a mandate protocol being implemented at the United Nations. Uh, and I know that uh, I contacted the office of Nicholas Hedman in December uh, 2017 in relation to a mandate protocol, if there was one in place. And he did reply from his office at that time, he said there was no uh, proposal uh, or Monday proposal or anything in place to receive the extraterrestrials should advanced extraterrestrials wish to communicate with the United Nations. I did then ask how would we implement such a policy and they replied saying that you would have to get a, uh, uh, a member state to propose that mandate uh, to the UN to be voted upon. Um, so in light of that, I then contacted the office of Nikki Haley, who was then the uh, US ambassador to the United Nations, outlining what, uh, what the ETs were asking for. I, I didn't receive a, a reply. I wasn't expecting it to. But again, because they have now given this in information again, and we've got February the 1st, uh, 2020 in New York, I've uh, emailed again uh, the office of Nicholas Hedman, and uh, two of his staff also in Washington. His office is in Vienna. And uh, I received an automated reply in, re in relation to the email that they had received it, but I haven't had a written reply yet. Uh, they're obviously thinking about it. I'm sure it comes as a bit of a shock when someone gives them a specific date. However, I am aware that there are many others actually lobbying the uh, UN at this moment in time. So it's not just all down to me. I'm just a, an extra um, person contacting them, supporting what I'm sure the others are doing. I know the WCETC, the World Coalition for Extraterrestrial Contact, uh, are lobbying the UN as we speak. And, and these are um, 
leading scientists, leading Chinese scientists, leading Russian scientists, leading European scientists, all lobbying the, the, the UN. So whether they will respond to me or not, I don't know. Uh, but now I'm sharing this date uh, with uh, various people. And uh, I think you know, I've had two interviews this week, one with uh, Dean uh, Caparella. He's a retired um, uh, off the name now. Journalist, retired journalist, uh, retired journalist from Australia, and uh, he's he's having a, an online aliens revealed live summit, and he interviewed me this week along with many others, and he's uh, uh, I've given him the dates just as I've given them to you, so the dates will be published and people, everyday people will be seeing these dates now, and what really ha is happening is it's a co-creation using shared consciousness. The more people that have the information, the more we expand that conscious thought, and that's where the energy comes from to create the actual event itself. Well, that's true, absolutely. <clears throat> but, you know, what I worry about is that so many people over the years have come up with dates for certain things, the end of the world, <laughs> you know, like the review, and they, it never happens. <laughs> and uh, so I'm wondering, you know, if the reveal, and I want to ask you a million questions about the reveal, if the reveal doesn't happen, does that negate everything that you've ever said? You know, like what happens if it doesn't happen? Um, what happens? Okay, okay. Very, good, very good question. I, uh, uh, they have tried this in the past, in 2010. Yeah. They were given the exact same information by a guy called Stanley Fulham. He's passed over now. Uh, there were some uh, sightings at the time, but there was no full reveal, I don't think. Uh, but they have tried this in the past and failed, but people still continue to move forward to, towards this reveal. And I'm part of that. I'm part of that journey, part of that story. If I relate a, a recent incident to you, uh, um, they always give me more information at a time when I'm not expecting it in one of these modalities of contact that I've explained. Sandy and I were in New York recently on a short vacation, uh, just to get away for four days. And uh, uh, on one of the evenings, we were getting ready to go out for an evening meal, and uh, Sandy was getting ready. I was reading my, uh, looking at my phone and reading an article by Dr. Joseph Burt. And it was an article about experiences who've had a dream where they see uh, multiple craft over multiple cities globally. Now, I've had that dream three times in my life, because every time I wake up, I'm very disappointed it was a dream. Uh, so I made a comment on the, on the post. I put, uh, turned my phone off, put my phone down, and uh, I looked out of the window in the hotel, and between two skyscrapers, I could see the tops of the trees of Central Park. Fifteen new foes appeared uh, immediately as I looked out the window. They moved into a former pattern, they disappeared, they reappeared and formed another pattern. There was no question in my mind that it was a precursor uh, to the reveal itself. And it was also confirmation of Dr. Joseph Burke's post. Uh, and I did inform him of the incident and, uh, and it's nice to get confirmation, but that was a precursor. And that's what I understand will happen uh, on this February the 1st. And as you say, if it doesn't, you know, we move on. Uh, we just, uh, uh, there may be someone else in 10 years' time who you're having the same conversation with. But uh, uh, I'm not saying, I'm working towards it. I'm very confident in the information. I know there are those in the government that want the full reveal, the full disclosure, but there are also those in the government that do not want it. Uh, and uh, powerful people outside of the government who do not want it. So uh, it, it's not an easy transition and we as experiencers are here to assist with that transition yes um you know there's lots of speculation on the internet with lots of different people talking about what the ramifications are if uh the reality of uh, extraterrestrial life um you know contacting or being a part of the human experience some say, you know, the downfall of religion and you know, it's just like so many speculate. I wonder, you know, I wonder if it's going to be that um, extreme. Well, they, uh, they, 
they they do believe in God as we do. Uh, yeah, but not religion. But but let me just religion, ask. No, but let me but, ask you. Let me ask you. Um, when you say they're going to, you know, bring a ship and reveal, you actually have spoken about it uh, through a channeling. You know, you channeled Ra, who's one of the uh, dudes on your council, and I want to chat to you about Ra because I'm interested in him. And um, it said that they're going to be outside and then the ship's going to land and, and people are going to come out of the ship and shake hands with you. Like, where is the UN? Is the UN in Washington? Is there like an office that is the UN? Well, the, the main headquarters are in uh, New York. It's in New York. Uh, just, yeah, just near Manhattan. Uh, they, they also the main office for the Outer Space Affairs Committee, which Nicholas Hedman is the chairman, is in Vienna. And then there's offices of the the Outer Space Affairs Committee in Washington, D.C. So uh, um, they're, they're obviously spread them out a bit. You know. I thought there was something in The Hague as well. But um, so where is this going to happen, Kevin? You know, if, 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 a, if well, a... They tell me it's, it's going to happen in New York. In New York? Uh, in New York at the uh, UN head, headquarters. And I say it is dependent on this mandate protocol being implemented. And there may already be a mandate protocol, uh, but they're not uh, telling us this. Um, I spoke with um, Steve Bassett recently at a, uh, a UFO con conference in Orlando, and uh, he uh, thinks that they may already have a, uh, uh, a mandate protocol in place. Because at some point in time, this is going to happen. And they're obviously yeah. not going to the last minute. They will be pre-prepared. And I... I did also speak briefly, um, only briefly, to Nick Pope. And my understanding now is that Nick Pope has a mandate protocol already drawn up, which he can present to the United Nations. And I'm sure there are others that, uh, uh, as I say, are already lobbying. And uh, in fact, I have a letter here, uh, which I'm possibly going to send. I haven't decided yet, but uh, um, there, there are many people lobbying. So it's not just me. It's probably me that's speaking out about the date. Uh, which is uh, a huge responsibility, I suppose. Uh, but uh, um, I'm happy doing it because I'm confident in the contact uh, all my life. Uh, and I'm confident, as I said, with all the modalities of contact as well. And I can communicate with them anytime I wish. Uh, and they uh, continue to give me. And in fact, it's quite interesting. Uh, the other day I said, right now, I've got this information. I need to get this date out. Uh, who am I going to contact? And then uh, I got an email from Dean uh, Caparella who wanted me to be interviewed for his uh, Aliens Revealed Online. It's already planned for us in relation to, um, uh, and they don't give everybody all the information. We have little pieces of the jigsaw. I think that's to protect individuals. So uh, not one individual is important in any of this. We all have that small piece. And if that one small piece disappears, it doesn't matter. You can still see the whole picture of the jigsaw. Mm -hmm. And I think they do that on purpose uh, to protect us. Okay, so let's get into the details of this. If this does happen, if all those protocols get in place and everything sort of runs smoothly, unlike what happened 10 years ago, where obviously it was thwarted by whoever or whatever, um, what's going to happen? So a craft is going to turn up in New York over the United Nations, one craft, two craft, a fleet of crafts? Right, well, okay, well, the initial information I was given was that uh, one craft uh, would land at the United Nations. But again, that is dependent. It already been uh, arranged from the UN side as well. I suspect that may not happen. I suspect that if that doesn't happen and there isn't a mandate protocol in place, then there will be a mass sighting over New York. Uh, and that was a precursor that I saw. That would then make uh, have the our government's representative understand that the ETs are communicating with some people here and there is a direct link to them. So yeah. if they decide to completely ignore it and then uh, we, uh, those of us in New York, on that date, if there's a, a mass sighting, that will be confirmation. And be, I, I say I'm very confident because of the precursor of the sighting that they showed me. So I will be there in New York on are February you, the 4th. Are you going, going up? up? 
the weekend away. She's not too happy about it because she hates the cold weather and the snow. But uh, I'm going to buy from. <laughs> well, from I won't be there. I'll be here in the sun. I'll be on the beach. <laughs> Anyway, I'll look up while I'm on the beach. I'm going to be obviously 24 hours in front of you, so yeah. Uh, so so it'll be interesting to see, and I say it's quite a good plan, really. I suppose that they've they've learnt from their mistakes in the past in dealing with our government's representatives or what they want to do. So they're they're now trying to do the disclosure to the people. Uh, through yeah, absolutely. You know, you know I, what, what's coming to mind is for those who believe no evidence is necessary, for those who don't believe no evidence um, enough. is enough. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, you know, you look on the internet. I talk to my brothers who are so into sci-fi. I've talked about this on the show before. They're such galactic beings and they totally don't believe in this stuff because, you know, they're, they're um, a product of the social conditioning. So my brother, older one, I've got a few, um, he just watches sci-fi all the time. And I said to him maybe a year or so ago, you know, do you believe in aliens? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, and I said, well, do you, do you believe that they're here with it? And he said, oh, I believe in aliens. I just don't believe that they could reach planet Earth. That's his, that's his logic, right? And okay. so he's thinking that aliens have the same propulsion system as humans, you know, that they have to be in a jet rocket and it would take them 15 million thousand years to get here from wherever they come. You know, he's not really kind of looked into the new physics and bending time. And I think he sees all that as sci-fi Hollywood. He doesn't see that as actual reality. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, and I've had another discussion with another brother, which, what would you think of it? Uh, aliens you know landed he said oh that'd be really cool I, he said but that's not going to happen that you know he just doesn't believe so they're products of the social conditioning so i wonder you know how you break that social to conditioning on mass you know there are obviously millions of people on the across the world that have contact and believe and like you have had experiences i don't think millions are exactly like you i think you're pretty unique but i mean there's plenty like you and um, people like me, I communicate with them telepathically too, or chat, chat away to them. And um, I haven't seen them physically, which I'm really envious of. I wish they'd show up in my house and I could see them physically. <laughs> they say to me, oh, God, you don't need that. You can see it with your third eye. And I, they say it's much easier for us to, um, you know, reveal ourselves in your third eye than it is physically. It's a bit more you know, effort for them. But I, I wonder, you know, I... I just can't see them landing on the White House lawn or landing at the UN. I don't even know if there's a space for them to land. I did land. ask them that question once. I did ask them that question. Why don't you just land on the White House lawn or land in, in Moscow at the Kremlin? And uh, they said it would be seen as, a, as an invasion and we don't want that. We want well, exactly. To as ambassadors, and as you would invite your ambassadors from, say, Russia, China, Germany, Europe, um, uh, we want to be invited uh, and have this protocol in place to receive us. So uh, that, that makes sense. That makes sense, I think. So we'll uh, we'll wait and see. But I think I spoke last time. Uh, uh, I mentioned uh, a, a lady that uh, had contact with uh, Otten D, and uh, I spoke to her this morning actually, and uh, she was able to tune into that frequency and was able to speak with Otten D, and she's one of the. Uh, people that's going to be interviewed, I found out the other day, uh, by Dean uh, Caparella. And so that's an amazing thing. And I'm aware of uh, three others that he's interviewed who have contact with the uh, uh, Council of Eight as well. So, in fact, there's three good friends of mine uh, who are going to be, well, no, three good friends, two are going to be interviewed. I'm not certain about the third one, but uh, uh, Kathleen Madden, who's well known within the uh, UFO industry, and she's a prolific writer on the subject. In fact, I have a, a, a new book here that uh, she's just published. And it's a, an, an amazing book. It's called Extraterrestrial Contact. And in the book, she mentions the Council of Eight uh, mm -hmm. in relation to the fact that uh, uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2015, I was asked by uh, the group of eight to go to a MUFON meeting down in Orlando. And I didn't particularly want to go. And I remember saying on my way down, I hope I meet people there who will help me on my journey. And uh, I, uh, at lunchtime, I went to uh, a sandwich from the canteen area 
and uh, it was full of people. That, I was surprised at how many people were there. And I, uh, I sat down at this table where there was just one spare seat and uh, I sat opposite a lady called Dr. Melanie Barton. And she was the person I was there that there was, I was meant to meet that was there. And through uh, Dr. Melanie Barton, I was introduced to Kathleen Madden and to Denise Stoner. So, um, but quite interesting that uh, uh, Kathleen Madden's mentioned in the book about the Council of Eight and, and about me. And another interesting point in that, uh, where she mentions me, it's on page 222. <laughs> and these two, these two keep coming up all the time uh, in relation to uh, February the 1st, which is 2-1-2020, 2 which is 2-2-2. Two, two, two. Uh, and I'm sure there's some significance here in relation to some synchronicity with these numbers. I did, uh, a friend of mine did ask her, uh, did she put my name on page 2-2-2 uh, on purpose? And she said, no, it, obviously the publisher just put it there. So, but, so, you know, it's a simple synchronicity, but I, I, think, I think it is there. But then the, the group of us, the four of us, Dr. Melanie Barton, uh, Denise Stoner, and uh, Kathleen Madden, we met at my house uh, once a month, and I did a channel and uh, gave the information directly from the Council of Eight in relation to what they're wanting to do. So, uh, and I've included some of those in the contribution I've given to the chapter for Ray Hernandez's book. So, and I think Kathy Madden's going to publish some of them. She's writing a new book at the moment, and I think she's going to put some in there as well. Uh, they're very important uh, pieces of information in relation to the, the Council of Eight. So, uh, uh, and I'm aware of three or four others that have direct contact with the Council of Eight. I'm not going to mention their names at this moment in time, but uh, I have confirmation myself that I've been given. So, uh, uh, it's, I'm not on my own, as it were. Um, you know, there are many people moving forward. Mm. Well, I would love to see it happen, Kevin. I'm a little bit sceptical about it, only in that I don't know if human consciousness is ready for it. And I don't think it's the mass consciousness that is not ready for it. I think it's the, it's the controlling, you know, governance of our, of our world. I don't think they're ready for it because I don't think they're ready to, to give up control, really. And uh, I think that, you know, having this reveal in that it becomes very public and it goes across the planet, you know, like um, would really, um, you know, get them, at, it would tilter their balance of control. So anyway, we'll wait and see. It would be a good thing, I think. Uh, but um, there have been mass sightings all over the world by hundreds of people. And that hasn't actually made any difference because as I said to you before, the people that don't believe nothing, no evidence will change their mind. And they just write it off as, um, I don't know, lights in the sky, flares, something. That is, that, is, uh, that is quite true. But let me tell you a brief story about a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Mash, his name. And I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning it. I might do, I don't know. <laughs> but he is a good friend. And uh, he's always been a skeptic all his life. He hasn't believed in any of this the spiritual side of who we are, uh, about UFOs and it is. Uh, but we still remain good friends. And yeah, I think, I've got a few friends I think like that. I just thought I was just a little bit odd, you know. So, and I remember <laughs> last, last year, was it this, I don't know, this year, last year, they come over every year on vacation, sometimes twice a year. And uh, we were all sat out by the pool and I went to get a beer uh, for the two of us and I went to the fridge and as I went into the fridge, I said, now would be a good time to show a coach. I came back, I sat down by the pool, opened his bottle, gave it to him and I had my bottle and then the, his wife was there and Sandy, my wife, and then a craft appeared and it shot across the back of our property in a movement that couldn't be done by an aircraft within about five or 600 feet of where we were sat. And uh, we all saw it quite clearly it moved three or four times to the left, then shot up and then shot up vertically and just disappeared into space. And his face was just, you know, what's, what's this? They didn't know what to say. Uh, but obviously because we all saw it. So that uh, opened his mind to some degree. And then later on, I don't know if it was the same vacation or not, but we had a full blood red moon and his wife was taking a photograph outside our house, at the front of the house, of the full blood red moon and uh, she took a photograph on the photograph when they developed it 
there was five orbs, five large orbs. And the orbs, I'm not sure you're aware of portals. They're at a higher vibrational frequency. And very often we don't see them with our naked eye. Uh, but the camera, these digital, digital cameras will pick them up. So I, he had a, another uh, modality of contact, shall we say. And then on one occasion, he was, he was very ill. We'd been out for a meal and he'd got food poisoning. And he was so bad we had to... Uh, uh, call the uh, local uh, 911 and uh, uh, he had an out of body experience so he's had three modalities of contact and now he's a changed man he, when I phone him up I've spoken to him today we talk about the UFOs we talk about the ETs so from one sighting to uh, another experience of the OBE and then seeing the arms it's opened up his mind and he's my age and uh, um, so it does show that people, even though they're lifelong skeptics, uh, they they are open to it. They are. Oh, I've lost the sound now. I cannot hear you. Sorry, I had myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so when I burp and carry on, you don't hear me. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Look, I've had many people on the show who have been ardent skeptics, who've had spiritual or consciousness awakenings and, and have completely done a 180 turn, turnaround in their belief system about who we are and what we're all doing here on earth. But I'm talking about en masse, like you're talking about a reveal that would be obviously on news all over the world that you know that ets are real and they're here and they're talking to us I, I mean that would have quite a profound effect on the whole world because the reveal has been happening for decades centuries i don't know as long as time the, i don't know the egyptians seem to sort of like hang out with um bird-headed beings they've got them written all over their walls you know we just see it as myth and fantasy but they knew it as their reality so it's really extraordinary, but we're in this time and in this sort of mind frame. And yes, it, it would be interesting. Well, perhaps, perhaps they have chosen New York because the New York people uh, are very formidable. And uh, I think that they will be able to absorb this. There are strong people that live in New York. And uh, I think that they've chosen New York probably for that particular reason. But as you say, if it happens, most um, usually governments get their, you know, military involved and they shoot them. And are you going to take over the world? Like that's the propaganda that's been spread through Hollywood and that aliens are evil and they're going to take over the world. And so if they land, they're going to be shot down by the military. I don't blame them for not landing on the White House lawn with our current consciousness. Um, no, well, they have been shot many times, I'm sure. I don't know if they've actually downed any craft, they may well have done. But, but I know they, uh, the ETs have demonstrated to the government uh, they've uh, disarmed their nuclear missiles, they've activated the launch sequence for the nuclear missiles. Uh, so they've shown that they can do this. And, yeah, yeah. and they do tell me that the only time they would intervene would be uh, if we started a nuclear war. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen now because of the uh, prophecy of uh, Chico Javier. Uh, that was uh, came to fruition this year. Uh, so I think the future is good. Um, I'm hoping this reveal will happen. And if it doesn't, then we continue on. I continue my journey. Um, as I said before, I'm enjoying my physical. I've now got a new lease of life. I thought I was I was winding down until uh, Art and D materialized in my bedroom and asked me to do this. And it just seems to keep growing and growing and growing. So, and now uh, you're busier than ever. Yeah, see, as you said, I think, again, it's your fault, Karen. You told me I was going to be busy. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, very busy now. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's all in, a, you know, it's a good cause. And clearly they've educated me uh, to be at this position. And, and nice to see, like, you know, my friends, uh, uh, Kathy, Melanie and Denise, uh, um, sharing the, the, the journey in relation to the communication uh, with the the council of eight, you know. So, uh, uh, and as I say, there are others now, and I'm sure there may be many, many more that they're contacting. Uh, but people are probably waiting to speak out, or they haven't been asked to speak out yet. Yeah. And we don't know how many people actually work within the UN who oh, are experienced. Well, well there are plenty. Yeah, there I'm are sure plenty. 
And, and I've been told that there are plenty of people that work in the UN that have open communication with ETs and know about everything, but they haven't right. spoken out publicly, but they, but they, yeah. Because I mean, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, if you have a, a, a very responsible position or a responsible job, you've got responsibilities, responsibilities to your family and uh, you cannot be speaking out about these things. I can. Uh, and that's probably why they chose me and probably why they asked me three years ago to start this particular journey. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, you can now. And, and this is what I wanted to go into on this, um, in this conversation with you. Sorry, <laughs> my tea digesting. <okay. laughs> because, you know, you talk about your friend who was very sceptical, but that doesn't matter. You're great mates and you get together and you hang out. Like that would have been your whole life, especially working as a policeman. You really, except for Sandy, your wife, and maybe a couple of other people, nobody has ever really known who you are. They've really just experienced the third dimensional sort of face of Kevin, who was the officer or, you know, the police officer and the husband right. and, and the father and so on and so forth. But they never really knew you, never really knew you because you didn't reveal anything to the public. What no, no, I only, only spoke to my wife about it and my brother. Uh, right. No one else yeah, knew brother. about it. You know? yeah, so yeah. Uh, uh, that was it, really. But uh, but I was just happy with the interaction. Uh, I say, I think I spoke last time I mentioned that uh, I thought it was per perfectly normal until I got to 16, 17, 18. And then I realised that other people didn't have these abilities. But now, now, I'm speaking out about it. Uh, quite a few people are contacting me. I had a gentleman yesterday or the day before, 63 years old. He mirror images my uh, experiences. Really? And, uh, yeah, it's just amazing. And I've had several others that had uh, different modalities of contact, uh, near-death experiences that have contacted me. And but they, they've never spoken out about it yeah. because our society doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, it does now. Uh, it does now. Yes, we are speaking out. And the more that, that do speak out, the more that will speak out. The more that well. do, the more that will. Absolutely. Second waivers, as Susie talked about. We talked about yeah. that on the, the second waivers. The job of the second waivers is to live a life and have these experiences <laughs> and then to talk about it, like to talk about their life experiences. So how did it, how was it for you as a police officer? So let's have a look at you as a police officer. You have the ability to leave your body, to project your consciousness. Like, did you use those abilities inside your work? Like I, you talked about as a little kid, you know, when you were going to school or when you were, or maybe as a young adult, you'd go and then to the end of your gate and then you'd think, I wonder which bus stop is busier. And you project your consciousness and go and have a look and you go, okay, that one's not as busy. I'll walk there. So that was one little story. Are there other, how else did you use well, it? Well, I, I did. I remember one person when he went missing one day and uh, yeah. I thought, perhaps I can find him, perhaps I can use my psychic abilities to find him. Exactly. But I, I was totally useless at it though. No. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't do it. I didn't find him. He was he was found. He'd been uh, walking home and I don't know, he'd had a hard step and he'd fallen over a wall. And, uh, but yeah, I, I tried to see if I could use my abilities, but they were, uh, I wasn't able to, no. But uh, I know others that have, but I wasn't able to do that. But again, uh, perhaps, you know, you, I did mention it once to a friend of mine, a colleague, and uh, mentioned it to someone else and there was a bit of ridicule that went around for a short period of time but then it was forgotten so it wasn't something we could really speak about at that time and they may not have allowed me or uh, uh, to do that because they didn't want me to be uh, exposed uh, shall we say at that time in relation because they already had a, a higher journey for me which uh, I'm, I'm completing today yeah, you're doing now. I don't know, that's just an assumption. But I did try to use my psychic abilities, but they didn't work. So uh, I'm a failed psychic from that point of view. But I can speak to extraterrestrials. I can speak to deceased people. Uh, so I've got other abilities that I'm quite happy with. So you never sort of use them in your daily life as a real estate agent or a, a, or a oh, police yes. officer? <laughs> yes, I've used them all my life. If I need something, I ask and I usually uh, receive it. Sometimes say I'm running short of uh, properties for listings for sale. I'll say to my guys, I could really do with a, another couple of listings, you know, I need another couple of closings before the end of the year. And then the following day, the phone will ring and I'll have a couple of people wanting to sell the property. So, yeah, I've used that all my life. And I've even asked for 
uh, for money in relation to I just need a, I just need this amount. And on one occasion, I asked for a specific large amount, and uh, uh, within two weeks, I got a check from uh, of that specific amount that I wasn't aware that was available to me, but it was. And uh, they gave me the information to access that, and I was able to do that. And then just recently, I'll tell you this quick story. The uh, I'd uh, about six months ago, I lost my wallet, and there wasn't there was about eight dollars in it. The usual credit cards and store cards and my driving license. So I cancelled everything, got new cards, new driving license. But there was, I had four photographs in the wallet, which were of Sandy. And I've had them in, that's my wife, and I'd had them in my wallet for about 35 years, these little small photographs. The ones he used to take in the booths and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And so I was disappointed that I'd lost those. So about two weeks ago, I, uh, I said, um, you know, you're all powerful, your uh, ETs, my guides, you've shown me many things over the years. Can you please uh, manifest my wallet? And the reason why I ask is because those photographs are so important to me, and I would like to include them in my new wallet now. Yeah. So uh, uh, nothing happened. And then a couple of days later, I was going over to uh, uh, Clearwater here in Florida, and I normally go on the 50, down the 75, down the 275 and into Clearwater. But I was going to a different location this time in Clearwater. So I Googled it and it took me down on the I-4, which is a different route altogether. Uh, same timeline, but a different route. And I don't normally go on that route because it's very, very busy. However, I decided to follow what Google has said on Google Maps. So I went that way. And as I was getting closer to Clearwater, there was a sign saying that there were some new uh, toll lanes, two new toll lanes. And I thought, oh, I wasn't aware of that, but I have a transponder in my car. I'll get it out and put it out on the dash just in case I need it. So I lifted up the uh, center console and felt for the transponder wallet. I felt my wallet there. I thought, there's a wallet here. I don't believe that. I couldn't take it out and check it because I was driving. The traffic was very busy. I got to my destination. I lifted the center console. I took out the wallet and uh, uh, it was my wallet. Uh, even the eight dollars was still there, all the cards. Now the center console, I checked in there when I'd lost the wallet. Sandy had checked in there. I'd actually cleaned it out and uh, I took out a couple of cables that I keep in there when we went to New York. Uh, and it, it certainly was not there. Now whether they took the wallet in the first place or not, I don't know. Whether I did lose it, I thought I'd lost it in a local store. Um, but to ask for it back and for it to manifest in the centre console in my vehicle. That's an amazing thing. So yes, I do ask, and I've used that all my life. So uh, if I need some help some, with achieving something, I will ask, and you'll be surprised. I mean, the, the wallet did surprise me. I must yeah. admit. Especially that, because you've looked at it. Extensively huh? looked. Especially because... Well, extensively. And it's only, I mean, the wallet's a big wallet, and the centre console's on its wall, although it's deep. Uh, it's very small and Sandy being in the centre console when we, we go travelling on the local turnpike we just reach in there and uh, and I say I've been in there two or three times and it, it definitely wasn't there so that's the, the I don't think we fully understand the reality that we live in in relation to manifestation using thought and consciousness um, oh absolutely but, that, that, I've had, I have so many stories like that so, so many so many stories like that um yeah i remember i was away once with my husband how many years ago a long time ago about 13 14 15 years ago and we were in upstate new york staying with some friends and so it was snowing and um we had parkers on snow parkers and we got out of the car and went into a shopping complex and i was looking around and he's gone i've lost my wallet i've lost my wallet i've lost my wallet and I just said to my guides, because I was just having a great time and I didn't want to worry about his lost wallet. I just wanted to get on with my day. And I just said, where's the wallet? And they showed me someone putting it in a drawer and they said, it's safe, you'll get it back. And that's all I needed to know. And I said, don't worry, we'll get it back. And he was worried because <laughs> it had $300 cash in it and right. all his credit cards and we were traveling and so on and so forth. Anyway, we went to the police and... and um, we said, you know, we'd lost it. And then we went back a week later, just before we left, and someone had handed it in. Some, so what he had done is he'd put it in 
what he thought was a pocket, but it was the lining of the jacket. And it just got out of the car, put it in this, what he thought was a pocket, and it just slipped out and fell on the street. And someone picked it up, took it to her office and put it in her drawer. Forgot it was there, thought, I'll take it to the police station. Forgot it was there. And then a week later or four or five days later, opened the drawer and went, oh, that wallet, I forgot to take it to the police station. Took it to, to the police station. We'd reported it. And all the money was there, was all there. Yeah, like, it, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah so, so, yeah, just lovely things. But just asking them and then them giving me this, it's okay, it's all right, you'll get it back. And so I just didn't need to worry. And uh, they gave me the vision of her putting it in the drawer, but they didn't give me the vision of her or where it was. I, no. didn't, I didn't ask that because they just said, you'll get it back. So, yeah. Can... There's as a, a bit of a colder cell to that, really. A friend of mine who was a psychic, I've got lots of friends that are psychics now, I realise. And, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, now you've come out of the closet, that, uh, Kevin. <laughs> no, let me see if I can find out where your wallet is for you. So she, she obviously asked, you know, where that she asks. And she says, Kevin, have you been uh, uh, looking at uh, patio furniture recently? I said, no, no. Well, I, I seem to get the information that you, you're looking at patio furniture and then you'll, uh, you, will, you will get your wallet back. Are you sure you haven't been looking at it? I said, no, no, we haven't been looking. No, we don't need any at the moment. And then probably six months later, which was a couple of weeks ago when I got the wallet back, Sandy and I had been looking for patio furniture. We'd been around all these different stores looking for patio furniture. And what she was really saying was, you will get your wallet back at a future time when you're looking for patio furniture. There you which go. Which is quite correct. And when I told her that, she was, that gave a validation in relation to uh, uh, really what she was saying, what she was giving me was the time when you will get it back. Yes. And she connected the time to when we were going to look at patio. We've now bought the patio furniture and we have it on our patio now. And I've got my wallet as well. So it's a win-win for everybody. My psychic friend's happy, I'm happy, Sandy's happy, you know. <laughs> so when you were, before you came out of the psychic closet, ET closet, uh, did you have any discussions with anyone in your life about psychic ability and consciousness and telepathic communication down there? Did you, or did you just live a really normal life and keep it all to yourself except for Sandy and your brother? Yeah, just a perfectly normal life. Uh, never told anybody, just accepted it that uh, I had these abilities. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the interactions and uh, uh, it, it helped me develop really. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm taking full advantage of it. I always have done in relation to asking for things. Yeah. Um, and once we realize we can do that, uh, we can actually create, manifest these things. It's, uh, I know I had, uh, I always had this vision of having a, a small house with a, a white picket uh, veranda uh, where you could sit out. And uh, I always imagined this. And then Sandy saw one once on the, uh, I was looking for some property for somebody. And she said, oh, uh, what's that there? I said, oh, it's a, 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 an older property. It's a bit of a derelict. She said, oh, I'd like to go and see it. And that was the, the property that I had had a picture in my mind for many years of where I would like to live. And uh, we now live in that property. So uh, oh, no. uh, things like that. They, they, again, you're really manifesting it. You're, uh, and I know when I saw it, <laughs> this, this is a property I've been looking for. Uh, it just, it's just exactly what I was wanting. You know? well, and somebody wanted the same thing, but, but maybe she hadn't envisaged the exact property. Yeah. But I had the, the front part with the veranda with the, the white railings and things. And uh, I sit there many days and think how grateful I am to be here, to, to be alive and enjoying this physical. Absolutely. Well, the beauty of you, Kevin, is that there's not a lot of resistance in you. You're somebody that um, bips through life, accepting everything as it shows up and not arguing too much with it. Like I said to you last time, you don't ask questions. You're not arguing. You're not saying, well, why? But why do I have to do that? But why? But why? You're just sort of, you're very accepting. And in that, you know, you have this ability to, you know, that's what we, if we're all more accepting and we have less resistance and less argument and less fight in us, we have the ability to manifest what we want really easily because it's that energy of flow that allows what we ask for to flow into our experience really easily and quickly. But most of us don't have that beautiful energy of acceptance where we're in resistance a lot. You know, we've got a lot of resistance about what's not right in the world, what's not right with us, what's not right with others. And we're sort of in that fight all the I would, time. All I, would, I, would, 
tend to agree with. I've never thought about that in, in, in that aspect, but yeah, I would probably agree. You know, I always tend to look on the positive, positive side. Sunny side. When, yeah. I, when I was very young, I wasn't aware that there were negative thoughts. And it wasn't until I got to about 14 or 15 and I thought, oh, there's negative thoughts as well. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always very positive, and I still am. I mean, I have neg neg negative thoughts now, like everybody else. But but when I realise it's it's a negativity, you can change it round and make it into a positive thought. And, uh, surely it's much ha much you're much happier if you have positive thoughts all the time because you're creating that positivity. Absolutely. You didn't know there were negative thoughts. It was a bit that. of a shock to me when when I realised there were negative thoughts as a child. I thought, oh. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> so you obviously came from a happy family then. Well, yeah. Well, there was only my mother. My father died when I was nine. Uh, but yeah, he was a, a great dad, as I'm sure all dads are. Uh, my mum was very forthright. We didn't have any money. And uh, my brother, we got on very well. Uh, we were a close-knit family, just the three of us. But my mum had friends and uh, uh, we had extended family, extended family friends that uh, helped bring us up and things. So we were brought up in a happy envi environment, a poor environment, but a happy one, yes. So. Um, you grew up in Wales, right? Was it Wales? No, in, uh, in the UK, uh, a small town called Wakefield. Oh, okay. So not near Wales. Well, it's, it's only about 80 miles from Wales. I mean, the UK do, is not Do you remember anyway. the um, incident where the mine fell down the hill and killed all those school children? Do you remember Yes, that? I think it was the Aberfan, yes. Aberfan, yes. yeah. Yes, that was yeah. terrible, was that? Yes, I remember that. I was a child at the time when that happened, yes, yes. In yeah. fact, it was the anniversary this year sometime. I don't know how many years. Yes, 50 years. It's like on Facebook, yes. Yes, well, The Crown, season three of The Crown has just come out and I was watching it last night and they have an episode all about that, all about the Queen, you know, not wanting to go and speak to the people and the political. Anyway, it was really interesting because it was before I was born or maybe just after I was born, I can't remember, but uh, I don't remember anything about it. And so it was new for me. It was like the whole experience. And I'm just thinking it would have been quite close to you, you know, because that happened in Wales. Yeah, well, not that far away. But I would say, I think the, I don't know what the width of the, the UK is, about 150 miles across, maybe, yeah. you know, yeah. 70 miles to one coast. We were in the centre and right. 70 miles to the other coast. So that's, uh, um, it's not very big. So, yeah. So what about talking as a, you know, as a psychic and being able to ha talk to sort of dead people? I don't like to call them dead because they don't, they always tell me they're not dead. They're more alive than I am. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But we call you dead people. <laughs> do you know, did you do a lot of that when you were a kid or I know that you said you astral traveled, well, that wasn't speaking of dead people to your grandparents' house and sitting there used to watch them. But um, did you talk to, did you see many um, spirits around people in that when you were, uh, yes, I would I would see spirits all the time and I'd go around to people's friends' houses and see the spirits there. And then very often I would say, yeah, who's that stood next to the fireplace? And my friends would say, who? Oh, well, that person stood next to the fireplace. I could see them, they couldn't. And I realised that then later that, uh, uh, but yeah, I used to communicate with my deceased father after he died when I was nine then. Um, oh. And I used to communicate with him then. And then uh, throughout my life, I've... Uh, I lost some friends and I communicate with those. Yeah. And as you say, uh, we say they are deceased. They're, they've gone to that high level of consciousness. And if you can access that, you can still communicate with them. And, uh, and using telepathic communication, which is what we do to, to speak with them. So, and when yeah. you watch these really experienced psychics, uh, the four or five that are probably the leading psychics that you can see on TV, uh, they're actually... Uh, the peak of the communication of using telepathy in relation to speaking to our deceased families and friends. Um, so, yeah, they're not dead. They're, I, I've met, as I said before, I think on your previous show, uh, my family members going back 300 years. Yeah. And, uh, I know that they are still there when my physical dies, and I've been shown my next incarnation. Have uh, you, which, Kevin? They've actually shown me my next incarnation. I'm not quite sure why they did that. I think because I know I don't have a fear of death anyway, because uh, I know that our conscious energy continues to live on. And then if we choose to reincarnate, we can come back and reincarnate again. And there's a lot of scientific evidence to support that now. Uh, but to have that information, to have that knowledge, 
uh, yeah, I think that's probably why I enjoy uh, the physical that I have now because uh, uh, it's only here for a short period of time. I've got another 30 years to go yet, I hopefully. I'm hoping to live till I'm uh, 95. I want to okay. outlive my grandfather. He was 94. So I've set a date of uh, 95. So that's what I'm, I'm working towards. So we'll wait and see. Okay. So tell us about um, your next incarnation. Why, why did they show you that? Did they say, you, I know you never ask people why. You see, I'm so quick. <laughs> if somebody shows me something, but they usually yeah, answer no, me. I, I always go, I why just, are you showing me that? And then they'll answer me and I'll say, okay, well, show me more. And then they will. And I'll say, well, why that? And then they'll answer me. But I'm full of whys, right? You're not. Right. You just go, oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I did. Actually. I did. I thought that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Oh, yes. yes. Well, that's fact, nice. Thank I've, you. I've tried to access it now to see what it's like, you know, but uh, uh, I have access, uh, access a small part of it. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> So how far in the future is it? So obviously when you say your next incarnation, you mean your, and I'm going to say next because they happen simultaneously, but your future incarnation on this planet, they've shown you your future. Yes, on this planet. Yes, it was, a, I was on, that's all uh, part that showed me. I was on vacation in Brazil with a group of friends. And okay. uh, uh, that was a, uh, it was, Quite interesting because there was a one of these large uh, parades, and there was a, uh, a the leading of the parade was a very beautiful woman, and I thought oh, she's beautiful. I have to get to know her. Okay, so I, I, so you were a male in this incarnation. Yeah, it's a male thing, you know. So Unless you were a woman who was anyway, who was a gay I woman. Did get, I did get to meet her. I did get to know her, and then uh, we arranged to meet at a hotel. But what I found out later the it was sandy reincarnated uh, as another female which was quite interesting i think uh, i have heard of people uh, i know of a couple of people who remember their past incarnation and then they reincarnate they reincarnate again and they both remember that they were together and i've also met people who uh, reincarnate and one of the partners will remember that they were together and the other one doesn't. So it was quite interesting, the fact. I don't know whether Sam would be happy spending another 65 years with me or not. But, <laughs> but, I'm sure she would. But listen, <laughs> how far in the future is it? Like, I don't know. Okay. I didn't ask that question. You I don't, don't ask questions. <laughs> okay. So, so when, Next you, time something, but sorry, when you go. saw the vision, when they showed you the vision, were you looking much like today? Like, what were you wearing? Yes, I would say probably almost an, an instant reincarnation. I was about 20, early 20s. I was, I say, on vacation with a group of uh, uh, male friends, and we were in Brazil. And uh, uh, But yes, uh, not too long. So probably when I die at 95, I'll probably come back, uh, uh, you know, a few months later, possibly. Okay. 60, 70. I don't know. I don't know. It's all... Uh, it's all conjecture, isn't it? So we could be looking 50, 60 years into the future and God, anything can happen in 50, 60 years in the future. So let's just say you die at 95, which is like 65, 75, 85. That's 30 years away. And, uh, and then you're about 20. That's another couple of years. That's about 50 years in the future. If you, if you reincarnated back immediately, that's, that's to say. So um, interesting because lots of people say, you know, I'm never coming back to this planet. This is a prison planet. This is so dense. It's so horrible. I think I spoke about this because I just love your positive attitude. You're just so accepting and loving and happy and happy to be here, even though you know you're not from here, that you've, you know, you're from somewhere else. You're so happy to be here. So you're not victimized by being human and all that, the struggles that humans go through. And, uh, and you're happy to come back. And so many people are not happy to come back because they think that this is such a horrible place to be. It's so hard, you know, so challenging with the density. But I often think about, you know, if we do come back to planet Earth, we could come back in 50, 100 years in the future, uh, 1,000 years in the future, and it would be a very different place. And obviously, if we're going through a shift now and we're evolving and expanding in 50 years, I mean, I've been involved in this for, you know, my whole life, but I've been actively involved for over 30 years. I've seen huge expansion happen in the collective and in consciousness and, and continue to. So if I'm seeing the acceleration now, imagine in 50 years, 
you know, well, who knows? Yes, I, I would agree with that. I know a lot of my friends uh, um, uh, are seeing the, the shift, the change, uh, the change in consciousness, and we're all part of it. And, and since I've been speaking about it, I've met so many other people. I've, I've mentioned all my friends today, uh, and they're aware of it, and their friends are aware of it, uh, that there is this shift in our consciousness. And, and this will, going back to the ETs again, this will allow the co-creation and the shared consciousness, the ETs, to take us into that, that future, that future world. That future, sorry, you froze again, that future. I would like to, I would like to read something to you if that's, if we have time. Sure. I, uh, the time is I did a meditation, uh, I think it was last year sometime. I did the uh, uh, Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey do a 21 day meditation. I don't know whether you've ever uh, uh, seen it or done it. I've done a couple of them and they're very interesting because it obviously opens up your mind to the higher conscious levels. And on this particular one, they, I know I mentioned earlier that the, uh, in Kathy Marden's book, she mentioned me on page 222. This 21 day meditation is normally 21 days, as one would expect, but they extended it to a, 20, to, 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 to a 22 day. So I did the last meditation and um, Orton D, uh, uh, I saw Orton D, I went to where they were, out of body as it were, and they gave me some information. And you mentioned earlier about religions and how they may collapse, whatever. And uh, I'd just like, to, there's quite a lengthy passage, but just three or four lines I'd like to read yeah, sure. in relation yeah. to, if that's okay with you. Okay, let's, I'll, have to, I'll have to read it so I won't be looking at you. Um, Right, part of this is, Art said that we were concerned that our planet was dying. Our animals, our plants, our fish were all in danger. This in time will affect our shared consciousness. Art said, now is the time to reveal our presence to you. We can share our knowledge and our technologies to help your planet recover. We are here by the power of divine. By the power of divine knowing, divine grace, by a divine plan, with divine love, in peace and love, by our desire of manifestation, become the change. And I thought that really shows that they're coming from a position of, of the, well, the divine. They've mentioned it so many times there. And, and I think once people realize that our religious people, uh, that they can continue with their belief systems to incorporate uh, the ETs and help uh, expand their own knowledge of their own consciousness without destroying their uh, belief in their, uh, their religious belief system, shall we say. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Kevin. And you've kind of read my mind a bit because my next question was going to be, I have um, spoken to a lot of people about earth changes. A lot of people were shown um, you might have been one of them, actually. Maybe you didn't, weren't. But when you were a child, did they show you any future probabilities of Earth? Did they sort of show you? No, I, no, no, no they I'm didn't. Sure anything like that at all. Okay, so a lot of people were, and um, you know, a young uh, channel, conscious channel, um, was on the show this year at the beginning of the year. She's coming into our inner sanctum, uh, Courtney Beck. You know, she only woke up a couple of years ago. She was in the corporate world you know, killing it in the corporate world, making lots of money. And she had a great relationship. She had the life of Riley. And uh, then she started meditating to try and help her sick partner. And she started channeling all these different higher evolved beings. And, and uh, one of them was Krishna and Isis and many people. And they talked to her about upcoming earth changes and, and actually warned her to move away from the coast in Australia. And I said to her, oh, well, if there's a big tsunami that hits the coast of Australia, it's going to wipe me out because I'm on the coast. So I wonder, you know, I wonder if the ETs um, hire extraterrestrials, extra dimensionals are coming to help us because I've talked to Gaia about this and she said, well, you humans, you know how to live on the earth, but you don't know how to live with the earth. When you expand your consciousness, as many of the indigenous have, um, have always known, and you know how to live with her, you understand 
her metabolistic cycles. You understand her cycles. You understand how to work with her. And so when she does have fires, as we're experiencing here in New South Wales and Australia, and, you know, when she does have her cleaning and metabolistic processes, you know how to work with it and you won't be devastated by it. Like the fires have just devastated so many. So I wonder, have they said to you anything about helping us with upcoming earth changes or... Oh, well, yes, without a doubt. They, uh, once we have this reveal, as I said in that short piece there, they're prepared to share their technologies with us to help us develop a sustaining planet, self-sustaining, exactly. and exactly. Uh, uh, to obviously help us as well. You know, as they say, if the we are polluting our planet at the moment, it is dying. We know that. We all know that. Yeah. Uh, we're not doing anything about it. Uh, some yeah. small things, but they're not large enough. Uh, so, yes, the, that's why they're very concerned. And that's why we need to have this reveal now yes. for our future generations, for the children of today, really. Um, so they will have a, a good world to live in uh, and a healthy world uh, with a healthy, healthy life and hopefully long lives like, uh, like, like we have. You know, but uh, yeah. with, without that change, I mean, I'm particularly concerned about the Fukushima in relation to uh, the pollution of that continuing to do. We don't hear a great deal about it, uh, but it's tremendously sad. And the ETs have technologies to neutralize the radiation Absolutely. and clean it up. I know that for a fact. Yeah. So um, the reveal itself, if we could just clean up the Pacific and clean up Fukushima, sorry, Fukushima, then uh, that would be uh, a tremendous thing for humanity as a whole. Yes, absolutely. So really they want to reveal to help us with the mess that we've created because we, as, human, as a human race, we've created a big mess and they want to help us clean it up, right? And, you know, they want to help Gaia herself, the planetary being. They want to help her because, you know, she's crying for help because these silly humans are just not, you know, looking after her. And it's quite true. Well, if, the, if the earth dies, we die. The earth has the oh. own nutrients. And, you know, it's not a difficult concept, is it, to understand? It's not difficult. That, uh, <laughs> you don't have to be Einstein. But, uh, if you don't have to be Einstein. It's not rocket science. But, you know, like governments and business people, they don't get it. They don't get it. It's kind of well, like they're, well, of course they're money is more important than, like, money. the planet. It's, just, it's you know, yes. that's the consciousness that they've been dealing with. I, I hear them just say, oh, you humans. Oh, you humans. You know, I just hear that a lot. Oh, you humans. <laughs> you know, because they think that lining their wallets with... Um, Money is more important than stewarding the planet and looking after the environment. I just, just don't get it. I've had this conversation a lot, you know, that little Greta's and many people on YouTube say, oh, she's all part of the cabal and, you know, they're all raving about how there's so much resistance against this poor little 16-year-old that has mobilised millions of people across the, the planet to actually speak up and get governments uh, to change and I'm thinking, are they changing? Are they listening? Is anything happening? You know, like millions of people are mobilised all over the planet saying do something about climate change. Is that actually having an effect on policy and business? Are businesses changing? Are they stopping their polluted practices? Uh, you know, like... Uh, I think we are becoming aware. I see more and more things each day where people are designing things to uh, well, yes, stop the pollution. Mm -hmm. So we are... We are slowly turning around, but uh, we need something more rapid, I think, to uh, to assist. I uh, agree, especially Kevin. with the, uh, uh, the Fukushima. That's uh, tremendous, really. So yeah. uh, we'll uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But that's what they want to do, and they say they people shouldn't be frightened of them. They shouldn't have fear. Uh, and as I say, if my friend can turn around being a skeptic all his life. Uh, then I'm sure other people can. And again, for the religious people, you know, uh, yeah. they can just continue the religions that they're taught, but just to encompass the the ETs and the uh, uh, and as I say, they they say you know it's by divine grace, by a divine plan uh, that yeah. they're here, that, that they're doing this. So uh, yeah. um, so we shouldn't we shouldn't be fearful. Yes, I know. They so they so want to help us. They they really do. And um, all they are helping us through millions of people across the planet. But I guess they have, they, mm, I guess it's a timing thing. I guess they want to really ramp it up. So if this reveal does happen on the first, because that's like literally around the corner, you know, here we are. Oh, yes. Uh, no, yes. We don't have to away. make one for that, do we now? Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> 
And I, I suspect that many people will listen to this after the first. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if it'll, if something will happen. You know, I'd love to see what you envisaged and talk about happen. I'm skeptical about it, only in that I'm skeptical about whether the consciousness of the powers that be are ready. I think that the populace on a whole is ready. I just don't know if the controlling powers are ready to let go of control, but I'd love to I see think that. I would agree with you. I think that is the key. Mm. It's our politicians and our politicians will have to change. They will have to start mm. working for the people instead yeah. of working for themselves, you know. So, instead of working uh, for business. Have, I'm sure we have many good politicians. Oh, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, we, and the ones that uh, uh, are just in it for themselves, they will have to move to one side. And the genuine politicians who are very good politicians, I'm sure, will help uh, in the transition uh, to uh, our, our new understanding of consciousness and uh, our place in the new galactic uh, community, really. So yeah. uh, it'll be exciting times. I'm sure there'll be lots of ups and downs and upheavals and uh, possibly yes. fighting for power and things, but uh, yes. uh, I'm sure we'll come out the other end. I'm sure that uh, in 50 years' time, we will have the planet that we should have, which is self-sustaining, uh, where wealth is shared, uh, we all have a home to live in, we have food, we have clean water, and we're happy as a species knowing that we're part of a larger galactic uh, family. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I had a million questions lined up and they've just all dropped out of my head. Uh, <laughs> sometimes that happens. <laughs> sometimes they go, okay, finish. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there's hope. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, so regardless of what happens on the 1st of February, there will quite possibly be a mass sighting of um, craft in the sky over New York. Um, yeah, I suppose the worst, worst case scenario uh, for me would be nothing happens at all. Yeah. <laughs> Then you go, I'm, oops. <laughs> I'm so confident in the information they give me. And that precursor for that sighting, that was just, I mean, uh, my contact, as you know, is, is lifelong. And uh, yes. they still, still amaze me, like with, you know, returning the wallet, uh, with the, the sighting of the 15 craft. And it's a journey. And they're guiding me on that journey. And uh, they could give me some more information tomorrow or someone else could contact with me where I could get the message out to too many more, maybe to millions of people. And uh, we'll oh, just have true. to wait and see. And it is, the, the consciousness is the key to our voice uh, in relation to raising our conscious understanding of who we are as a species. Well, I wonder how we can get you on a show that's going to get this message out to millions of people. I was just thinking of Red Table Talks, but they don't talk about ETs. I wonder if they would. I'm pretty sure Willow's a, um, a hybrid. Uh, anyway, I'm just, my thoughts are so... So what we can do, people that are watching this show, is that we can see it happen. We can visualise it. We can feel it like it's happened. We can feel a good outcome from it, we, you know, instead of our military group trying to shoot them down we can see people accepting and being loving and open and, and um, we can visualize it we can see it happening and also you know see the politicians or the powers that be and the business people that don't want to let go of control we can see them turning around you know like your skeptical friend we can see them shifting their perspective and stop mm. thinking about the bottom line and start thinking about humanity there are so many wealthy business people that are out there that have done that you know well, bill gates is one of them and and what's the guy the foundation that he gave all his money or gave him all his money warren buffett you know they were so focused on making money and then when they had plenty of money they, their focus shifted from what's in it to me to what can i do for humanity and help the planet so if we focus on those powers that be rather than resisting them and saying oh bloody politicians and the cabal and oh, you know if we let go of the resistance and be more like kevin <laughs> be more happy and joyful and grateful and accepting and allowing and see life through a positive lens then on mass we have a huge power of influence i mean actually singularly we have a huge power but if everyone that's watching this does that uh, and sees it in a more positive light then collectively our consciousness really has a huge power of influence. Even though my show doesn't talk to millions, um, it talks to you and you have the power <laughs> of influence. 
<laughs> talking to the well, people listening to this. We'll wait and see. As you say, it's only a few short weeks away, so we don't, don't have long to wait. And uh, I'm very excited myself to see what happens. And uh, we'll just continue. Uh, worst case scenario, I'll have a weekend vacation in uh, Sunday for three days. So that's really good. Worst case scenario, yeah, you go to New York <laughs> yeah, and have uh, could do some good shopping or something, yeah. Yes, yes. So that's look up, deal. keep looking yeah. up. So the message is look up, look up, look within yeah. and then look up because uh, they're up there. I, I've got to say, every time I look into the sky, I see them. Oh, they're just there by the millions. There's just there's so many people, you know, in the sky. It's not They're not available always to the physical eye, although I do see them a lot with my physical eyes as lights in the sky or orbs or things like that. But they're there. They're all around. Oh, us. They're, they're, they're definitely there. And uh, I said they're around us all the time. All the time. We, just, we just don't see them. You know, I mean, they do open up from time to time. And uh, I say on some occasions when I ask them to show up, they do. Other times I'll ask them to show up and they don't. And then, uh, but uh, but when, if I look back at the whole journey that I've had, it's uh, uh, just really a continuation of learning about consciousness itself to bring me to this point where I'm comfortable to stand up and say they will appear on February the 1st, 2020. And uh, if they don't, then they don't. But, uh, uh, Let I'm, me ask you just before we go, because we're going to wrap it up in a minute. Did you ever okay. get in contact with Stephen Greer? Because I know they wanted you to talk to him. Uh, no, I, um, I have no reason to. Um, I know he's, uh, he's very busy anyway. I did get a message for Stephen Greer uh, quite a few years ago from two of the council members from Orton D. Right. Uh, did he ever changing. contact you back and say... He did, anything? yes. He confirmed. He thanked me for the information. Okay. And he, uh, uh, they said to give him... I, when I asked them who shall say the message is from, they said, tell Dr Greer that it's from the light beings. And I never heard that term then, but yeah. I got in contact with him by a third party, oh, uh, Gary Hesseltine from the UK. Mm. They, he passed the message on and uh, uh, I did get a, an email response back the same day from Dr. Greer to, uh, via Gary Hesseltine that he yeah. thanked me for the information and would take it in the, under consideration. And he also sent a, a photograph he'd taken of a light being while he was out in the field one day. Yeah, so that's yeah. the only only contact that I've had with him. I mean, uh, he's been uh, working towards this for many, many years, oh, as yeah. many others have. And I'm, uh, as I said before, I'm totally unimportant in this. I'm just really the messenger at the back end of the whole uh, development of consciousness and the whole movement in relation to the ETs and who we are, really. Yeah, well, we all have our, we're all important and we have our roles to play. Um, everyone, everyone that's listening to this is important, even just thinking yeah. about this. Oh, without stuff. a doubt, without a doubt. We are important as human individual species, as it were, because yeah. we have that shared consciousness. Yeah. And again, that's the key. And once you understand that, then uh, individuals are unimportant per se, shall we say. Yes, absolutely. And they tell me that you and uh, Stephen Greer are going to meet uh, soon. So, um, so that'll be interesting. <laughs> I'll have to get you back on the show to talk about that. So we'll have to have another chat next year after the first and see what Okay, happens. well, we'll do that. We'll arrange to, uh, I'll keep an opening for you, Sharon, because you, you keep telling me I'm going to be so busy. Yes. Uh, I will come on after your show, after the February the first. Uh, I'll come back on your show and give you an update. And, uh, <laughs> uh, that'll, that'll be very interesting. So, I'll look so, forward to that. so you have noticed since we spoke last that you've been busier, right? Oh, without a doubt. And I blame you totally for that. Point. You totally blame me for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, Kevin, you're always a joy to speak to, and you're fascinating. You're absolutely fascinating. Uh, yeah, I could quiz you all day. There's so many other questions I could ask you. But thank you again for coming back and sharing your wisdom with us. And I so look forward to February 1st. You know, February 1st is two of one of my really good friends. One's a total skeptic and one's a bit on the fence. Uh, but she's a very good friend. That's their birthdays. Is that February? Right. Yeah, oh, it's their good. birthdays. They're both born on the same day. They were neighbours together. And I wonder if that's significant or not. It doesn't appear to be significant in any way, shape or form. But I wonder if there is a significance there. But anyway, yeah, February. There may, there may well be. We there may know well be. Us. Who knows? Until after the day. So. But I'd like to thank you again, Karen, for inviting me on your show. Uh, and I'm sure you're 
audience will expand exponentially. You may reach that million target one day. And uh, uh, well, well, who knows? But I'd like to, you know, maybe I, anyone put their heads and think about where we could get Kevin on to sort of speak to a bigger audience. You know, I introduced you to Kevin Moore and you went on his show. Yes, uh, a very good response from Kevin's show. Yes, he's got a bigger audience. 500 people viewed it. That was yeah, surprised. Well, have you had any contact from people from his show? Oh, a lot of contact from yeah. that his particular yeah. show, yes. Yeah. And a lot of experiencers who haven't spoken out before have contacted me as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it just shows the amount of people that are out there. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what percentage. And then it makes you wonder what percentage of the our population really... Uh, understand that the ETs are here. I know who I can introduce you to, Elisa Medhus. Uh, she quizzes people, normally psychics, but you're a psychic. Oh, you yeah. can talk to her. She's got a big audience too. They talk about afterlife, but we've done a lot of that talk, you know, talking about mm -hmm. afterlife. Her son shot himself, Eric, who's a great guide in spirit. Uh, I don't know, about six, seven years ago now, he was 20 and she started blogging about it. Now she's got a big audience, not a huge audience, but a big audience. I'm just thinking who else. Um, anyway, I'll put my thinking cap on and see who I can introduce. Okay, to. okay, that sounds good. I say we've only got the short of eight, nine weeks now, I think. And uh, so we'll just see what happens and what I'll happens. keep uh, talking about it. Thank you. Thank you again, Kevin. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Big love to you. Bye bye. Oh, well, what did you think about that with the beautiful Kevin Briggs? Amazing, amazing life experiences. I was uh, at a party the other night and someone was telling me about an extraordinary person. Have you heard of this extraordinary person? They're extraordinary. They're really extraordinary. And I said, there's so many extraordinary people on the planet right now. Belinda Womack said in my session with her that all the ascended masters are here and all the archangels are here and all the, you know, people that are on councils and that they're actually incarnate in physical bodies. And you would never know it, walking down the street, <laughs> interestingly enough, the more humble they are and the less in the limelight they are, the more that they are these amazing people. Jesus, Buddha, the consciousness of Jesus and Buddha is incarnate in not just one being, but in many beings. And we're all here doing our work and you're one of them, the light weavers, the, um, the shift makers, the change makers, the disruptors the difference makers the new world teachers so many names i can give you but we're all here to make a difference to this world to be a part of the shift in human consciousness and to look after mother gaia mother better to be more in the flow with her energies and her cycles and um, as kevin said the ets can teach us how to do that because we have not been doing it and there's many ETs here incarnate as physical. I think when I spoke to Garnet uh, on one of the last shows I did with him, not the last one, but a couple before that, he talked about ETs being here in their ET bodies, but they have this technology, which is like a hologram. They kind of wrap this light around them. And so our physical eyes perceive them as human. And when they switch off the hologram, they look completely different. <laughs> it's all possible. It's out there. It's sci-fi. It's Hollywood, but it's fabulous imagination what did um einstein say logic will take you so far imagination will take you anywhere how do you think we create our world through our imagination that's the creative process thought so anything that you can think of is possible is a possible probable reality and we're probably dovetailing with it living with it right now so we're surrounded by off earth you know extraterrestrials we call them et don't like or alien don't like that label but beings that are not um, normally terrestrial, earth terrestrial beings. They come from other places in the cosmos and they're here either in their physical body or their light bodies or in our in physical bodies or as hybrids. Yeah, they're here and we're looking at them all the time. We're looking at them all the time and we just see them as normal and human and we're talking to an alien. <laughs> You know, we're saying no such thing as aliens and very well we could be standing in the supermarket queue with the one talking to one, the girl at the checkout. You just never know, just so many. So what do you think? Tell me what you think about the date and, um, yeah, your help seeing the powers that be relinquish control and step back and allow, allow help, allow help from our friends who are you know have technology they have shown this to me too when i 
stress out about all the plastic I see in the supermarkets. And I say, what are we going to do? They say, well, the ETs have the technology to completely eradicate every bit of trash in the oceans and on Earth, on the Earth, on the land. They have that technology. They're, they're not going to give it to us until we um, take responsibility and become accountable for what we're doing. Because, you know, when you teach someone, you just don't give them everything. You, are, you ask them to learn. You ask them to become accountable. It's like a teacher saying, I'm going to do an exam and I'll give you all the answers. No, the teacher says to you, go off and learn and study and document and remember or you know, learn and then come and do this exam and we'll see how you're going. It's kind of not the best analogy, but it's a bit like that. We're responsible for creating our own reality and so we have to be accountable for the energy we flow, for the ideas that we indulge in, for how we live our lives, what we do. Are we inspired by the ego mind that's all about me or are we more collectively focused and inspired like in everything we do and in everything we think? Are we doing it for the collective or are we doing it for our own personal gain? There's nothing wrong with having your own personal gain because that's the way this world was set up as this individualization of consciousness, you know, separateness. But that's shifting. So we need to move from that separateness and move more into the collective and... Um, yeah, things are going to change. So why wouldn't you want to come back and see how it's all changed and live a physical life experience in a future world where we live completely differently? I would, for sure. I don't want to like leave this world and never come back. I'll come back in the future and I'm sure I'm here. Actually, as a kid, I always thought I came from the future. I always felt like I'd been landed in prehistoric times. I had no understanding why I felt like that. I do now. But as a kid, I always felt like that. Yeah, so it's interesting. So I'm already here on this earth in a future time and connected to that being. I think she's a girl. I don't know. I'll have to ask. <laughs> Kevin said he came back as a guy. It's interesting. So, yeah, let me know what you think. February 1st, the date. And uh, visualize it. Talk about it. Tell your friends. Tell everybody. Share this, share this video with people, share this podcast with people and um, let's see what happens on February 1st. It's just around the corner. <laughs> They're going to land on the White House lawn. It's not exactly the White House lawn. I don't even know what the UN looks like in New York after I finish this. I'm going to Google it. I suppose they're not going to come in a massive ship. Maybe just like a little ship that's the size of, you know, a big dining room table or my living room or something. I don't know people tell me that when they go into these tiny little ships they get in there it's like the TARDIS in um, Doctor Who you know you go in it's like much bigger than it looks on the outside <laughs> my car's a bit like that looks smaller than you get in it's like oh quite spacious anyway so who knows it's going to be a little craft and all these people <laughs> come out of it you think how did you fit all those people in there it'll be exciting to watch and there's great hope for humanity if we do allow our higher dimensional friends to help us with the mess that we've made especially with the pollution and oh, there are brilliant minds here I have to say I'm a big fan of ocean cleanup you know that uh, I think he's from the Netherlands he's it was a young boy that invented the ocean cleanup I follow them on Facebook and he's cleaning up all the uh, pollution and plastics in the ocean and he's just launched a um, uh, ships all over the world he said a thousand rivers are the worst polluting rivers that that contaminate the ocean because the ocean uh, plastic comes from the river system people throw stuff into the water and rivers and floats into the ocean more than people throwing them off boats you know it's coming from our river system so he's uh, putting out he's got he's got big funding behind him which is fabulous and it's mostly funded by individuals people like you and me people that donated to his cause i've donated and uh, he's um, built these machines that is cleaning up the plastics before it reaches the ocean. And um, anyway, things are happening. Things are definitely happening and it's very encouraging. And we live in amazing times. Very emotional at the moment. Don't know why. I've been for a week or two. <laughs> get very teary when I think about things. Not teary sad, teary emotional. Just like, isn't it beautiful? Like if you see a a puppy being rescued, I'm like, oh, I'm crying. Anyway, 
that's just me. <laughs> I'm not going to ramble too much longer. Oh, I'm going to drink my cup of tea. I'm out of cup of tea. So I love you all and uh, let's see how we go. Visualize a bright future. Visualize us connecting with our cosmic family and tell your friends all about it. Tell them, get the word out there. And if you know of another podcast show that has millions of people watching it, let me know or let Kevin know. I'll put his contact details on my page. All the details to Kevin will be on my page on my website. I don't normally put it under the YouTube or iTunes. I put them all, everything you need to know on the page. So go there and have a look. And um, talking to another beautiful uh, new awakening being coming up, uh, Burnett Sherman. And her and her mom, they're fabulous. They've got a show too. And uh, when I look at her, she's got such a clear third eye. So clear. So beautiful to see. It's just full clear vision. Anyway, beautiful. And uh, lots more people, fabulous people coming. Love you all. Big love. Bye for now. Oh, yeah, Courtney Beck. We had the inner sanctum this weekend with Penny. It was fabulous. She gave us, she shared her story and she gave us this manifestation exercise, which was fabulous. And Courtney Beck, who was the psychic I was telling you about on the show with Kevin, is coming into the inner sanctum. She channels Krishna and Isis. She downloaded like three books in a matter of months after she woke up and she's working on a fourth. And she's amazing too. Talk about clear sight. Amazing clear sight. Amazing. One of the young light weavers here doing incredible work and so she's going to come and be our guest teacher in the inner sanctum and of course i'm there uh, once or twice a month and you can talk to me and chat to my mob ask them questions ask me questions and i'll give it to you i'm going to do more of those talks from my mob they've got lots to say um, as we move into next year they've been harassing me for years saying you know it's great that you talk to all these people but can you just like you deliver your own messages out there to the public or our messages through you and I said yes 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 I'll do that yes yes so I'm going to do more of that so stay tuned <laughs> big love I'm going now bye